right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, Natalie, Bill, who will be joining us, I think. Oh, he's here already. So Natalie, Bill and I are really delighted to welcome you to this session today. Um, so this is the, the, the first webinar of the renamed SIG Gender and Diversity. We're now Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. I think we reflected on our own positionalities and came, came about that conclusion that we need to change the name to better reflect who we are and what we want to do. Um, so in today's webinar, we will discuss and learn more about positionality statements. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have with us today the authors of an amazing paper that was published in the Journal of Engineering Education in 2021. And it has been amazed us since then. So we have today Stephen Siculis and Cassandra McCall, and I think um, Alex is joining us a bit later. Um, so we'll be talking about positionality statements, sharing their experience, why is it important to engineering education research, what's the role, what's the impact of positionality statements and what we do. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. I'm already thrilled to, to be here um, and that you bring many questions and make the most of it. So Stephen, Cassandra, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, are, are my slides sharing okay? Yeah. All right. So welcome. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Stephen Seekills. I'm uh, um, presenting here with Cassandra McCall and Alex Mahir will be joining us any, any minute um, and then he'll be one of the um, co-presenters as well. Um, the general topic, yeah, as Ines said, um, Reflexivity and positionality statements. I added my own like little subtitle here, understanding research as peopled. I just think, you know, sometimes like if you know you're going to present on something that is a relatively long vocabulary word, like reflexivity and positionality, you might as well have a like short <laughs> translation of that for if it is truly new to someone, then that's not a super helpful, you know, <laughs> why why should you care about positionality statement? I would say that my short, my shorthand for it is. Um, you know, we are always, you know, people as we're researching, as we're, uh, as people are participants in our, in our research studies, as we're educating, as we're working towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, as you said, and those are all very, you know, people-centric activities, so all the dimensions of ourselves as people um, kind of color and, and come into um, all of those activities, so uh, I, I think of positionality as just a way to help understand that process of, uh, like, this very person-heavy um, activity. <laughs> so, um, oh, yep, those are our presenters. Okay. So uh, my my rough agenda, um, just a, a little bit further introduction, uh, and there are a lot of you, so um, the main, the way I'll have you introduce just by like saying hi in the chat and, uh, and letting me know some of your um, basic starting points for positionality. Um, well, these are the my initial guiding questions, kind of like the questions that I think, um, as Ines mentioned, might be like kind of like on our on your mind and kind of uh, driving uh, today. But if you have other questions beyond these, so guiding questions: What is positionality? Why is positionality important? When are positionality statements helpful? How do I write a positionality statement? Um, so that's kind of like what the content will be. But um, but feel free to throw other questions in the chat. Um, and we will pause for like other like unmuted um, further open question and answer. Um, but yeah, if you have if you have other questions as they're coming up, just feel free to put them in the chat. And I'll probably be doing a lot of the talking, and Cassandra and Alex can help um, you know keep track of other good questions and uh, bring them to the floor and interrupt me if it's um, if it seems more worthy. Um, pretty flexible. Um, so then open Q and A, and just uh, my, our thought was uh, a lot of times. Cassandra, Alex, and I end up talking about ourselves a lot um, in these um, presentations, but we were going to like save that towards the end um, if there's time uh, to go to kind of as kind of like the modeling towards the how do I write a positionality statement type topic. Um, so we're, we're going to keep our, our own introductions a little bit uh, shorter at the start, just so that we get more into some of these other, um, you know, topics about positionality. So that's my plan. So my quick way, you can you can also add to this just like a hello, who you are. Um, but my my quick like little survey, uh, audience survey is just what's your familiarity with positionality? Uh, you can just say a kind of no familiarity. I'm starting from square one. Like I, you know, these are the first, more or less the first time I'm hearing these words. Some familiarity, I think I could define it, use it in a sentence or a lot of familiarity. I've already read your journal paper. I've learned about it in a methods class, you know, some other sort of workshop or something. So um, 
Uh, oh yes, as a like a little moment of um, audience participation, I'd love it if people who were twos and threes, meaning you could have used it in a sentence or do know something about it. If you, I, I just, I think this is a, a kind of a contextual topic positionality. So I think there's like not necessarily one firm definition. Um, so I'd love to just hear what you, what your take is on what positionality is, what's involved with positionality, how you would describe it. You can unmute, you can uh, just write a few words in the chat. How my identities and experiences affect my research. Great, thanks, Virginia. Your position with regard to the literature on subjects and point of view influencing your bias and assumptions. The epistemological beliefs and approach, theoretical and epistemological of your research, helping others to understand you, Exploring the assumptions you make due, due to your experiences, where researchers are coming from. For example, related to insider research to clarify your previous role within a certain area topic. Depends on the context where you provide it. What is relevant to your understanding of approach to a specific paper project concept? Great. Being attentive, attempting to be transparent with readers to my own identity and how it influences my perspective. I like that one, yeah. Great. Those were all really great. Um, it's related to perspective awareness. I and Carolyn really want to, uh, as a quality criteria. That is okay. Yep. All right. Um, you can keep them coming if you were still typing, but I'll move us on. So. Um, this is uh, the final line of our paper. If understanding our research requires understanding one another, we must become a community that continually and bravely tells one another who we are. Um, so that that's uh, kind of how I see it. I think like some amount of positionality has to involve um, telling uh, like kind of, it has to be about ourselves and it has to be in relation to um, the reader, like uh, t telling each other, um, Something and it does require some amount of um, of understanding. Um, you know, like if you if we truly haven't done much reflection work and we don't know how our identities might have impacted our work, then we don't have much to say. And I'll say it, I do think it requires some amount of bravery. Um, it's different levels of bravery depending on what you're sharing with people. Um, but it is always a little bit feels a little bit just kind of scary, risky to talk about oneself um, so honestly in a in a paper. So. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of like our guiding, one of our guiding like calls why why we're um, trying to do this work and kind of make it more, um, you know, kind of like set set a bit of a norm that this is like an okay thing, a, a helpful thing to do in our in our community. Um, so yeah, you named a lot of these um, in the what is positionality. I think um, considering all aspects of researcher as a person, that's kind of that was like kind of one of my shorthands. I think uh, the researcher perspective, like John Tay mentioned, we, there's this phrase researcher as instrument, which essentially in qualitative research means that there's, the researcher is always, you know, having to sit in a space with their body, with their voice, and they are in kind of in some ways the instrument. So not a survey protocol, not some other like engineering tool. That's the research instrument, but they're their actual person. So you kind of can't subtract all of those researcher as person elements um, when doing qualitative research. That one's particularly qualitative research. As Cass mentioned, there are a lot of these that have to do with all types of researcher. Um, reflexivity. Um, so a, kind of just a similar, I, I think of just a similar word to positionality, but um, kind of a, maybe a more um, reflective, those words are very parallel to each other, but like a more reflective awareness of like, you know, who you are during the research process and how you're making choices about it, I think is kind of what's conveyed by reflexivity. Awareness of our demographic identities, awareness of bias or perspective that um, comes with that uh, demographic identity. I wouldn't want to reduce all of our identities just to bias or like, or, or removal of bias as like the only like sole goal here. Because um, I think we all kind of bring 
perspectives. But you know, it's it's through I think awareness of positionality, we can also like have a heightened awareness of possible bias um, and kind of help address it. Maybe appearance of bias, uh, you know, the presence of bias. Um, and our relationship to a participant community. So if we're um, insider, as somebody mentioned, insider or outside of a specific, say, demographic community or professional community, um, it may be helpful to understand our own relationship to it and to clarify that uh, to others. So those are some of the um, what positionality is. I didn't mention, but I, I just like this type of photo where we're like, it, we just look like we're really reflecting on ourselves, but we're also like looking out into the big world. I think at the end of the day, we shouldn't be, positionality shouldn't be you know, kind of the quote unquote navel gazing. We shouldn't like only be thinking about, you know, ourselves. Um, we should also be thinking very relationally, um, like to the to our topics, to the outside world. Um, and particularly in engineering education, I think that's, you know, all again, because of all of our topics, research topics are at the end of the day about people. We have to kind of think about our relationship to all of those people um as well. Um, Stephen, yeah. can I go ahead and add a couple things? Yeah. Um Part of the impetus for writing this paper was we put it in a diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice space. And I think as an act of writers, you know, just being academics and disclosing these identities and those relationships, as Stephen said, we kind of think of it also as like the celebration of, of the diversity of our academic communities. And we typically we wanted to bring to the forefront kind of these these identities that typically get hidden, right? When when you're just reading someone's written work and um, wanting to get to know each other more. Um, with that, you know, as Stephen mentioned, um, being brave. Um, we also want to emphasize that you don't have to uh, disclose all of your identities or identities that you're uncomfortable with you know, during that time. Um, Stephen and I did have a hard time writing our first paper on this topic where we both disclosed different identities about ourselves and, you know, wondering what, what the implications are. We were both going on the job market at the time um, and, and how was that going to impact our job prospects? Um, so it's a very personal thing, um, as Stephen mentioned. Um, but we're hoping that the more people do it, the more of a norm it becomes, and the more we can celebrate these diverse perspectives that we're reading about and bringing to the table. Great. Thanks, Cass. Uh, I saw Alex is on the call. Alex, do you want to say hi? I don't see you, but... Hi, everyone. I just... Hi, Alex. Sorry, I'm, I'm running a little bit late. I was at a different meeting, but uh, happy to be here. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've covered a baseline about what it was positionality. Um, why is positionality important? Um, uh, I just, I guess um, you all have started giving some of your answers, I think implicitly by kind of explaining what it is, um, you know, thinking about perspective and how we can be transparent, uh, how we can clarify ourselves to our readers. But in addition, um, yeah, I think there is sometimes a need to address our um, whether we have an insider or outsider author perspective and voice. Um, I'll give you some examples of that. I think that if you aren't familiar with what an insider means, um, kind of like if it might make a difference uh, if we were writing about a specific community and we were inside that community, then some of the same language we would use might be a sign of solidarity. Whereas if we were an outsider to the community, it might be seen as, you know, some, some of the same language choices could be interpreted um, differently. So um, that can be helpful to know who, who's writing this, who, who's talking to me. Um, that's also not kind of a monolith across your uh, research team. Um, there can definitely be members of your research team that are inside in some ways to some parts of a research community. I would also, I just want to add that like it's I don't think this insider thing say like only um, only like women can write about women's issues only black folks can write about black issues I think I think there has there's an element of truth to that but I would not say I'm I am not a person there's a little bit of like a social uh, social media and like kind of present culture feeling that that is true um, and I would say I am not a person who subscribes to that holistically I I just think I am often an outsider because I care about diversity inclusion issues and I identify as a white man. Um, so a lot of the main issues of gender and racial marginalization, I am 
kind of positioned as an outsider to the marginalized um, group. I just think it takes more thought, more care, and more more attention um, if I'm going to write um, about it. I'm, I'm also often writing in collaboration with others um, when when writing about a person to whom I am a, I am an outsider group. So I just wanted to not I I would not be advocating for a completely you know. Uh, like kind of didactic, you insider outsider, like that's dividing us. Um, uh, help contextualize your work, um, yeah, in particular to different contexts that, like you know, you may you may need to uh, help people understand how you fit into um, you know the context of your work. Help clarify your message and purpose. Um, kind of a lot of this could be similar to insider and outsider, um, but I think positionality is just also a place to like be explicit about our work. Uh, sometimes we may. Kind of like as as Cass said, like in the in our brief and kind of like sometimes impersonal way of writing, um, we may send an implicit message um, that is not the one that we intended to send. And I think a positionality statement is kind of a good opportunity to just be very clear what our purpose is and how that connects to the research we're trying to do. Um, and then if other people differ with how we went about carrying out that purpose, then that's good. We can we can at least all be on the same page about what what that like message and purpose was. As I mentioned, addressing bias or perception of bias, I would not necessarily say that writing a positionality statement removes all bias from you know a a piece of writing. Um, but writing a positionality statement is a good way to help um, notice bias, speak about bias, uh, you know, try to like limit bias um, if if there is some in our in our uh, work, and provide a better understanding of methodology and the way um, a study was carried out. So as I mentioned, the like. If I think about the topic of like researcher as instrument, it really does make a difference to me, like what the identity, if, if we're researching something um, that involves, you know, people, particularly diversity topic, it really does make a difference to me what the social identities and possible appearance of the interviewer were. Um, I may not care as much what the guiding fourth author's social identities were. Uh, that may have that may have influenced the study a good deal less than the first author interviewer. Um, so I think there's some context to um, how how positionality impacts um, methodology. All right, these are um, some, I have not adapted these for European context. So I think that's maybe one of the contextual <laughs> like experiments here. I developed these off the top of my own head and my own experience right, uh, being editor in Journal of Engineering Education and just other, other um, uh, writing and uh, work I've done. Um, so these are in to help motivate the like, when are positionality statements helpful to help give us an idea of like, when and why they might be helpful. I just wrote a few sentences. The idea of these sentences is we don't know anything else other than this sentence. So if we're just imagining reading this in the middle of a paper, of course, you'll always have more context than just one sentence, but there still might be a sentence that makes you wonder. And then, you know, like the, the lack of, I, I would say like, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a thought for how a decontextualized sentence, um, what it can make us think. Um, so I'll give you a second to think about this. You can put answers in chat um, uh, if you have any for what types of assumptions would you make about the sentence or its author? What types of reviewer comments or critiques do you think might arise? Um, or audience co comments. Um, it doesn't have to be just reviewers, just, just any, any reader, um, what, they, what they might think. Um, so the, the first sentence I had was, our Black families need to take more responsibility for their students, sorry, education. So I'll just give you a couple seconds to think. If you have thoughts, you can put them in chat if you need clarification on the question, let me know. Any assumptions you would make or you think a reader might make? They are not a member of a Black family? Okay. Black families are irresponsible? Okay. Authors are non-European. We don't use the term Black over here. Thank you. Probably Black themselves and on a conservative spectrum. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll wait a little more.
A lot depends on the identity who, of who says this. Absolutely. Education is split, ours and theirs. Uh huh. Author is not Black. Also, R seems pejorative if the authors are not Black. Uh huh. <laughs> All right, I think that's a good a good start. So yeah, um, I I noticed within the within those um, responses we had both people assume the authors are black, and we had authors assume the authors are not black. So like, uh, I think that's one important divide uh, is like um, sometimes people just presume they're going to be understood either by reviewers by authors. Like it will be very clear. I would have never written these sentences if I wasn't a, you know, X, you know, identity at part of our community, or I should be like free to use this language either way, I'm whether I'm not in the community or not in the community. Um, but we, we may really not um, kind of it, it, people really may take a sentence like this decontextualized and, and interpret it in two very opposite ways. Um, uh, I appreciate the comment about this is not, these are not maybe the terms that uh, certain European um, countries are using. Yeah, that that makes uh, perfect sense to me. Um, so yeah, like that that is another like cross cross national, cross cultural like piece of context that we all have to kind of be aware of and is a great uh, positionality, another great place to contextualize that. I remember um, being a part of, um, a review process one time where um, someone was using a term uh, which was the preferred correct term for a black person in their country, but it was a very pejorative term for a black person in my country. And I, you know, like didn't, if it had, if without context of where that person had submitted from, it would have been a kind of like red flag deal breaker with the context of where the person submitted from. It was a more conversation. I think we should help shift this to some middle ground where we're all equally able to read the paper and you don't like anger readers in uh in you know my country um uh and yeah the um so let's talk about the like our black families need to take more responsibility for their students um education like that split and the and the like i liked that depending on who you are this could sound pejorative um and could sound conservative and you know um, it, it could count, sound conservative either way, and it and it could sound pejorative. I I agree. Like so, when I think about how, like language is um, language is contextual. Um, yeah, I think about those like shifts in meaning. Um, like if if I say our and I am like literally a part of the community, then maybe that is like my my like quick and easy way to like show solidarity with my community and think about like what what that community needs to be doing more of if i use a word like our and i am not or like not clearly a part of that community it could seem sort of possessive it could seem sort of like telling telling a community what to do like i i i sort of own that community with this hour um i'm yeah Cass, Alex, and I are all on um, the J the Journal of Engineering Education editorial board, and these might seem like minutia, but I feel like the minutia, like the language, exact language phrasing, phrasing ends up being just a whole lot of what I can see reviewers, reviewers and authors um, kind of getting in conflict about sometimes. Like I can, sometimes I can tell uh, a reviewer has interpreted this person as outside of the community. Uh, that in of which they are writing about. I can have a guess by their names that they are not, but I kind of have to, I would have to nudge someone to help make that, like bridge that divide uh, because I can just tell that that's, that's how the interpretation has gone. So even though this seems somewhat subtle, I think these are the types of things that can be. Uh, Cass, Alex, any, any, anything to say? I just wanted to, okay. Engineers must develop more awareness of social and ethical concerns. Um, this one is not, it has no diversity inclusion, like clear angle to it. Uh, just any any thoughts about like what the assumptions you'd make about the sentence or its author? It might be more subtle. I just uh, it just this one actually did come up to me in a in a review. The author has some background outside of engineering. Okay. Engineers know nothing about ethics. Uh-huh. Engineers don't have enough social and ethical concerns. Engineers have no social intelligence. Okay. These are all getting towards. <laughs> yep. 
The author of the sentence assumes engineers don't know about ethics. The authors could be, author could be an engineer, but one's better for their community. Yeah, um, uh, these are the types of sentences I feel like like happen in engineering and publications all the time. Like they're kind of like value statements. They're kind of like normative calls. Like let's do this. You know, there's something. There's some sort of value statement behind a whole lot of our engineering ed work, and we might think of this as a very neutral statement. Like you know, engine. This is like just a, like of clear. Um, you know, value to the uh, community. I did have a question from a reviewer once that like, it would have, it made a big difference to a reviewer um, whether um, the writer of the sentence was uh, an engineer or not, or like what, the, what exactly their position, everybody probably writing to an engineering ed journal has some sort of positionality relative to engineering, but like what makes you say engineers don't have, or what makes you imply that engineers don't have awareness of social and ethical concerns? Like, was there, you know, workplace experience? Is this like a, a topic that you're like often like trying to help students understand um, kind of like where, where does this come from regarding the um, community? Um, or is it uh, just kind of like a, a generic um, statement, uh, like, you know, without, without much personal, um, anyway, engineers, although we might not think of engineers as a like kind of specific community identity community, um, it is a, it is a group, a professional group that we can either sit inside, outside, or have some messy relationship with. Like for instance, I personally don't do any actual engineering anymore, but I did at some point. So if I write the word, we engineers must do this better. I do, like I am, I am calling back to like a part of myself that was, you know, like really doing engineering, but not every engineering education scholar is necessarily doing that either. So anyway, engineering is a people group. Engineers are a people group. So they um, like thinking about how you indicate whether you're inside or outside of it could still could still affect how people take this, you know, would this also sound more pejorative if you were fully outside acting sort of like an outsider to engineers, like engineers, oh, that, this reminds me. And the other, the other thing that this actually happened to me, I was in a presentation by a mostly math education professor who said something, something like at the time that just seems so absurd to me. He said something like, engineer practicing engineers don't even use math uh beyond like geometry. And I was like, what on earth does that mean? Like, uh, like <laughs> I'm like just transitioning to my education PhD from having been an engineer and like knew that I use differential equations on a regular basis. I'm like, I don't, I don't know when that, that that's either a completely uninformed statement or a completely biased statement. And anyway, it struck me very much like this is a math ed researcher who probably has like maybe fully misunderstanding the engineers. And it really distracted me from everything else he ever said. Like that one statement about like engineers only do this. I'm like, hold on, <laughs> like from whose understanding? So that was my, that was my other relationship to this one. All right. Research interviews investigate the daily struggles and strategies of disabled students. Um, any thoughts, assumptions, uh, comments, critiques? Sorry, I missed some of your other comments, but thank you. Yeah, we've been we've been monitoring the chat, so yeah, a lot of great conversation. Yeah. Author seems not disabled. Authors believe in unbiased research. They excluded disabled student who can't speak. Okay. I'll wait a little bit more. Not a very specific statement. Experiences could be better than struggles. Unclear what is meant by struggle. I'll just start talking, but I'll leave the chat open. Okay, only disabled students participate in the interviews. The struggles and strategies are small and simple enough to be investigated in the interviews by the interviewers. Sure. So the two, like the two things that I like, 
was kind of, I, I think this is this is a constructed sentence, but it's I think it's emblematic of types of sentences that show up in papers um, a lot. The two types of things I wanted, I was kind of pulling here are, um, it's very disembodied, uh, research interviews investigated, uh, like, like I like I mentioned, um, particularly if there's a person at the other end of the this interviewing interview being interviewed, and particularly if they have some social identities, it really does matter to me who's conducting that interview. I'm not I'm not thinking to myself that if this person has no uh, uh, disability that they can they are completely barred from conducting this interview, but it makes a big difference to me if they if they are coming into this interview. Um, and the disabled student believes that they are talking to a, another uh, disabled researcher um, or or not vice versa. So um, more this this construction of this interview that's very depersonalized in terms of who the researcher is um, makes me think that though that might be the way we've constructed a lot of these sentences. So we may get very little information in this type of method section about who there's very little sense that there's a person conducting this interview, but of course there's a person conducting this interview. And of course they brought certain things to the interview. Um, Cass can comment about that. Ed. I'll just say the other um, the other piece of this uh, is I specifically, I think similar to the like, which terminology, um, the terminology around uh, disabled students could have been controversial. Um, the capitalization or not capitalization, the um, disability first versus the person first um, language, that could all have been um, somewhat controversial, at least in our US context uh, and for the um, our, our disability community. Um, so it's another place, there's not necessarily one, one firm right thing, but it's another thing that could have come across as like more dangerous or pejorative if you were, you know, more outside of the community, but could be just the way you refer to your own community if you were inside the community. Um, so those could be very helpful to uh, clarify because, you know, again, we might, we might just be making assumptions. Oh, the product, the average journal author is probably not a person with a disability. And therefore we're reading this sentence as if they are, like using this language and it's like, you know, you know, pejorative, but perhaps that's literally the, the, their, their community's language. Um, Cassie, do you have any other comments about this? I know this is connected to you. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, I think one big thing here too, to notice, and, and I run, so I write a lot of disability re related research, um, also identify as disabled. Um, and one of the things I'm really noticing across all these different contexts, whether I'm talking with students or colleagues, is um, just being aware of, of the language that's constantly changing around these topics. Um, some students I talk to are even, even in the same context. So even in the same, in my context of the US, you know, some students are very offended by saying um, disabled. They would rather, you know, they typically identify as having a disability. Um, other students, other colleagues are very much identity first, where it's I'm autistic, I'm disabled, you know, and I think a lot of that just has to do with these language shifts. And so a lot of times what I'll do in my papers is write about how I'll, I move back and forth between these different terms. Um, and try to capture more of what the participants are saying in that work, you know, to show that there is this nuance that's existing there. And so whatever way you can apply that same approach uh, to your work, I mean, it does take some space, right? We, <laughs> we already have limited space in a lot of our writing already, but it has been very useful. It also has really helped me um, concretize what I, what I want to write about, how I want to write about it, and how I'm um, trying to represent these participants in, a, in an authentic way, so. Steven, you're muted. Okay, thanks. <laughs> that could have gone a long time. Uh, uh, I think that's I think it's the last one. Latino and black students are marginalized within engineering education. Um, any this one might be more subtle. Any um, assumptions or comments you think might come about from this um, from this sentence?
So uh, cisgendered authors uh, not using Latin A or, or maybe Latin X. Any other thoughts? Deficit-based approach, blaming the students, aren't at an HBCU or HSI. Could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. European authors do not use Latino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one other thing I, um, these are these are roughly around this, the same, some of the same things I was thinking might be in this. The, the one fairly subtle thing that uh, came up for me um, in a in a like reviewing editing um, situation one time is that Latino and black are not in alphabetical order. So what, what why have they been placed in the sentence this way? Perhaps in the context of the study, there is a reason Latino uh, students would come first, but the author felt that it was a, um, that there was in that study that there was like no particular logic to um, why, and they weren't like alternating which sentences. Um, so the like, uh, I believe, um, I believe the, my, this was again, like an editor reviewer um, situation, but I believe the authors do identify, the, the lead authors were identifying as black. So you could also have interpreted this ordering of the sentence as like a kind of humble solidarity, like, like, let's put like not not my community um, first, but it was coming across without positionality. Um, it was coming across as just an arbitrary valuing of uh, Latino students over black students. So uh, Alex, do you have any other comments about uh, about this one? Um, I think I wanna also um, emphasize what has been said there, right? That yeah. um, in, the, in the chat, um, the Latino, Latina, Latina students, uh, can also be Afro descendants, right? And so um, that is also separating or essentializing, right? Um, if if you think about it in terms of anthropolo anthropological methods, right? Essentializing certain identities and um, uh, and communities. Um, the other one that comes to um, to my mind is that um, this idea of um, thinking of Latino, Latina, Latine students, um, Black, African American students, as marginalized, comes also from a uh, deficit approach, right? So yes, they might be marginalized in terms of um, representation, right? It doesn't mean that they're not able to do things within engineering education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Those are the those are the like some of the like when is it helpful um, uh, examples. Um, I'm sure there are lots more better ones out there, um, but those are a start for your thinking about it. So, how do I write a positionality statement here? I just wanted to preview um, uh, the paper, the the work we did in the paper, because that was the one of the main goals of that. Um, here is our like some of the overview we did of the literature. Cass, do you want to uh, comment on this? Yeah, sure. I mean, so honestly, so this is a pretty um, cursory review that we did um, at the time of writing the paper. We realized very quickly that you know we wanted some sort of impetus to show why this was important um, to be published, you know, in the Journal of Engineering Education but also recognizing that we could write like a whole book on this one topic, you know, because there are so many places that um, we didn't look. Um, we just kind of scoped it to the main um, JEE and related, uh, related venues. So really looking at just ASWE and JEE. And in, in terms of how we were conceptualizing the paper, we wanted to look at American Society for Engineering Education because in that context, we felt that that was more where these types of conversations were starting to take place when we would meet with each other at conferences and things. But we weren't seeing a ton of that in um, a ton of the types of positionality that we're talking about today. We weren't seeing a lot of that in the literature. And so that was essentially what we were trying to convey in this lit review. Um, 
I will throw it out there that if, if, you know, we want to do like a cross collaboration, you know, with different contexts um, across countries and that would, oh, it'd be so fascinating to look at all of yeah. these. Um, but the biggest thing is we were noticing that this contextualizing methodology and these were these categories that we came up with just to kind of get at the heart of what the author was saying. Now we recognize that we couldn't extrapolate things that the authors weren't saying, right? So even though an author might have been using a positionality statement to address bias um, and talking about it in terms of research quality and checking methods and things like that, um, we were wanting to see more about the authors themselves. Um, and so we weren't, we didn't want to make any assumptions about that. We didn't want to say that one type of methodology or excuse me, one type of positionality statement is better than the other because everybody uses these in different ways. But we just wanted to highlight that really talking about your own identities and how they're interacting with your work is something that we don't typically see outside of a research quality space. And so that's really what we were getting at um, with this review. And if you guys have any questions about that, um, you can definitely let any of us know. Um, we still have the papers that we looked at and everything. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I will end with that, but just to get a baseline understanding. So yeah, I would just to add on to that, I would say that the this category one kind of sounds like um, a lot of somewhat uh, like a like not much statement about self. There's not much statement about the author author identities. Um, there's just a lot of kind of statements about reflexivity practices. Like we bracketed, we we took analytic memos to bracket and think about aspects of self and like made sure to. Um, divulge that and like think about that and like examine how it was impacting the research. So just kind of kind of philosophical, interesting, but a little bit vague, not not very personal. Then category two tended to be a somewhat like a laundry list of identities, but they like sort of didn't end anywhere. Sort of like author one is blank, 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 uh, like a white woman from the like Midwest, uh, like, you know, who experiences this uh, marginalized identity. Um, and then that's that's it. Like that's the end of the sentence. And then um, category three was tending to do some of these personal um, identity, uh, make some of these personal identity connections, but then tell the uh, reader what they mean. Like uh, like as a uh, white woman from the Midwest, uh, like as I was researching this topic of you know uh, urban education, I like thought very critically about like how I was an outsider to this topic and how I like, you know, had to lean on co-authors like to, or, or like expand my own thinking or something like just, just some more information about like what those identities have to do with, uh, the research. And that's why just uh, in this like kind of cursory big picture, here's, here's what the community is doing right now. We, we saw a lot of value in reading category three, um, positionality statements. They just, they, they really read as helpful uh, you know, really focused, like really, really telling us what, what we should know about you in order to understand this um, research. Um, so we, like with that knowledge, we kind of, we embraced <laughs> category three and uh, collaborated to develop and refine a contextualized approach to uh, positionality. So these were all the co-authors. We were the first three uh, co-authors um, and also, uh, just to be perfectly honest, like Cassandra and I were already kind of in collaboration. There's a there's a work, you know, an early days um, conference paper, connected conference paper out there that like is the same thoughts. Um, but particularly collaborating with this group was like trying to expand our own social identities um, so that the, you know, the paper just like very, very roughly speaking, I had this hunch that this, this paper could be valuable, but wouldn't it be not all that valuable if it if the things that we were finding were only relevant to white people, which both Cassandra and I uh, identify as? Like that would be that would be so much less useful a paper <laughs> if if it happened to be like all from a white perspective. So in the in the spirit of you know thinking about positionality, like that was that was like one of the one of the intentional you know aspects of the study design um you know to and to not essentialize uh, the um, where we also really admired and trusted the this group of um authors they were all really a lot of them were 
Alex, I believe, was like in our lit review of Cassandra and my like already lit review as like one of the one of the um, category three. <laughs> so so we had a feeling that Alex could like bring and help us understand um, the paper topic, like uh, that he would that he would you know add to it. So it wasn't wasn't just about broadening our social identities, but that was definitely definitely a piece. Um, so in this paper, um, I think Ines already put that uh, um, citation in the in the chat if you need it. Um, uh, yeah, so this the this is just one of the figures from the paper. I just like it because it kind of shows the movement um, from our that on the left we've got dimensions of one's identity. Um, these could be, you know, uh, there could be more or or fewer that you consider. You don't have, like there's no no firm rule to exactly what you consider, and they could definitely be contextual to what is what is meaningful to a particular, particular research community and topic and person. But in some way, there's an examination of dimensions of one's own identity. Then there's a reflection on positionality dimensions of the work you're doing right now, of the research uh, that, you're, that you're taking up. So the research topic, epistemology. I have, I have on the next slide, I have some translation of these. Uh, so I'll, I'll just use the, the vocabulary words for now. Epistemology, ontology, methodology, researchers, instrument, communication. Um, and then there's a movement towards uh, kind of the impact, the the like what's beyond this paper, like uh, so like what's the um, like so we also aren't like just ending in how how our identity impacts um, our epistemology um, because in the, at the end of the day there's a bigger purpose to even that even that question um, you know how we interact with participants how we interact with uh, with our outputs in policies procedures knowledge, knowledge systems how we um, discuss as existing assumptions and implicit values. Um, so these are the, like some of the just guiding topics, guiding thoughts. Um, you could consider them reflection questions that you might ask yourself, um, you know, during a study, you know, at the beginning of a study, early in your, in your research career, or right, you could ask yourself again, right, the moment when you're finished with the study and just writing up a paper. Um, I think they're, I think they're always, they're always kind of new. They're always for me. They're always new and changing. Um, like how I how I think about them. They're they're pretty complicated uh, and contextual and changing. So um, the they kind of um, across these six dimensions. How does your positionality impact what research you choose to do? Um, how does it impact how you know what you know? How does it impact what you observe as a researcher? How does it impact how you make methodological choices? How does it impact how you relate to participants, how does it impact how you represent yourself in writing and other communication. Uh, so just a like additional comment about the utility of this uh, graph, this these reflections. Remember that it, when thinking of the word positionality in this context, you can kind of translate that to uh, a sense of your social identities. It not, does not have to be an exhaustive uh, sense, um, but in some ways, like what, what, how do any of my social identities impact this what what research I choose to do. Um, if it feels like you're kind of stuck with I don't I don't know how to conceive of this question. You can just start by asking like, oh, okay, well I am I know that I identify as a man. So how does being a man impact what research I choose to do? Maybe it doesn't. You know, or maybe I don't have a good clear story. Maybe I maybe I'm not clear on that. Um, but maybe you have some some social identities that impact some of these that you are are clear and it makes sense to um, be able to tell others about. Um, and just as a like as another comment, I do recognize that like a lot of these words are familiar. Epistemology and ontology are like in that category, you know, of like slightly new words. So I just the how do you know what you know? Uh, I think is a is a useful way of thinking about that. Um, like in more like. Um, there are like we could talk in more objective terms or like or like trusting more the subjectivity of uh, of participants and like you know conveying them or some something um in between um so yeah i think that i think that could be i i don't necessarily think that that has to be a holistic in all terms i always believe in you know one one thing it could be very specific to how do i know what i know as a researcher because as a researcher we're always thinking a little bit about knowledge and truth and you know what what it's always some sort of epistemological act to write a research paper like like what what should i tell you what what should you know how do i know that how do i you know engage with you as a as a trusted source of knowledge and ontology i just as another like mild vocabulary word i just 
I translate it to like, what can we observe? What can we see? What can we know? Um, kind of like, what, what can we, it not, I guess, similar to epistemology, but what do we, what are we like kind of more attuned to and aware of? So um, our own, uh, our own insider or outsider status may make things more, if we were, if let's say if we were a, um, you know, uh, a, going to do a participant observation in in a field in a in a in a space somewhere, and that community had a lot of practices, vocabulary terms, cultural uh, norms, and if we are an outsider to it, what we observe is going to be a very different. Will have a very different meaning to all of it. What like what what stands out? What stands out as significant? What what meaning we ascribe to it? Then if we are an insider and like familiar with all of these and like trying to take take notes on them. So that's how I think about um, ontology is kind of like what what our social identities like bring so that uh, we all carry with us our own like norms and like tendencies and therefore like things sort of like either stand out and come to our fore or they don't. And I think that's a, that's a, a way of thinking about that one because it's kind of, you kind of, whether you're an insider or an outsider as a researcher, you'll probably have to sort of play with insider and outsider to if you're completely inside a community you some in the phrase make the familiar strange you'll have to in some ways put yourself slightly outside of your own community in order to reflect and write about your community if if it all just seems ordinary and like this is exactly what we do maybe you have nothing to write about maybe you have to like externalize and think just separate a little bit but if you're an outsider you also have to think very um critically about what you're what you're able to see as an outsider and maybe like the dangers you could be putting uh yourself in as a researcher because you may not know may you may not understand the uh like insider group so i think that's i think that's how i think about um that one i'm going to pause for more comments from co-authors because i've been talking about and also just open questions on that part of it and then we have more time uh for um, more positionality uh, reflections and more questions. Yeah, one one thing I, I did want to add, um, just to kind of emphasize Stephen's point on, you know, thinking about all of these topics, epistemology, ontology, methodology, all of these in, in the different studies that we're working in, a lot of times we get the question of, so do I just have one positionality statement? And our answer is always, you can have as many positionality statements as you want. The big thing is just, you know, meaningfully um, engaging in the topic yourself that, that you're working in. So a positionality statement that I write if I'm analyzing an intervention in a statics class is much different than a positionality statement that I will write if I'm if I'm focusing more on an advocacy based piece for um, students with disabilities in engineering. Um, so so keep that in mind too. Um, just really think about you know the work. It goes back to that awareness um, that that we were talking about in that paper that was brought up by Yante and, and Carolyn. Um, and um, yeah, so so keep that keep that at the forefront. I guess just one one thing that I want to add, and this might be different for um, for a lot of the people who are attending the uh, the session, um, but in the United States there has been a I guess a, a wave of research in terms of um, decolonizing methodologies in a sense, but also in trying to stay a little bit away from paternalistic views <laughs> from, from research uh, and the way in which research is done. Um, so I think that the positionality framework, or at least the guiding questions that we're presenting here are important for you to think about um, what do you think of the people that you are researching um, or um, whether you're being honoring the methodologies that come from those communities that you're trying to research rather than making it extractive, but actually, but um, instead of making it extractive to actually um, working together with the community. Um, 
And I think it's also very important how do how do we see ourselves as part of those communities or maybe don't, whether we are invited to those communities to be part of the to do the research in those communities or not. And I think it is important to disclose that because it is also important to um I guess uh provide um uh, the, the perspective the uh, that you have on um, on those particular communities, right? Are we seeing them as less than us? Are we seeing them uh, from a deficit lens perspective? Or are we trying to uplift the voices uh, um, of those that we are um, doing the research with? I was also thinking on different research methodology traditions and positionality statements make a lot of sense in qualitative research. Um, they also make sense in quantitative research, right? Although that bridge is not that easy to make, but the way we interpret quant, quant data and even the fact that we're using quantitative methodologies to research a certain topic might may say a lot about ourselves and how we see ourselves as researchers. And any comments on that, on how to if there's a way to produce positionality statements in a better format for quantitative research, just just some thoughts on that. Yeah, um, the 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 starting place that I know um, is is kind of like is common for quantitative and qualitative research is like the like how does your positionality impact what research you choose to do I know that that is like kind of like relevant a relevant starting point um I am yeah more of a oh I think research topic and uh communication how you present yourself in writing and other communication I think like quantitative researchers probably have some of that like tendency can be trained sometimes in that tendency of a very depersonalized writing and then like more more of the there are the researcher like seems to not seems to be a disembodied non-person um can like crop up so like how how are you going to like you know communicate and and uh, you know represent yourself i think those are those are two dimensions but i did just want to comment maybe that as well as the comment uh, in the in the um, chat about it being a depersonalized approach, I think it kind of I think I think that that's an interesting um, take. I think in the paper um, there's some writing about like th our methodological traditions also have like there are also people doing the methodological traditions. So even you as a research community. Um, or an individual methodological community or a like philosophical community are also sort of bringing some value systems and you know people dimensions to them um so we may have uh, as alex was mentioning like decolonizing in in a framework of decolonization it, like i i think a lot about i i am an ethnographer a lot of the american ethnographic tradition is like somewhat problematic like uh, like a, a lot of like what it did was just send white american scholars to Africa and Asia and then write about them in an exotic way to bring them back and like amuse, you know, uh, American intellectuals and like the weight and like, you know, kind of like awkwardness of that of that system with the possibility of like still doing new and productive things in the in the present day, having learned our own lessons to like do a less paternalistic thing when we are doing our, our and I think an awareness of our positionality like it helps I think it helps think about those methodological traditions like what might be contained inside them as well as like what our own relationship to it and our own adaptation of it um like for our own present context and like who we are um so that I guess I think um in us like I guess I think about quantitative research you know somewhat the same way that it's like there's a tradition I don't know all of the epistemological assumptions ontological assumptions and like shared values and norms that are like being carried along with as baggage inside the quantitative methodological conditions but uh traditions but i guess i think that they are like like yeah so like those would be the ones that i think like will like 
be the easiest to latch onto, but then there's like still, to me, there's there's still going to be a lot of other dimensions to unpack um, in these traditions and thinking about, you know, how they how they've what they've embodied. Uh, that's that's one of the things I wrote in the methodological uh, methodology section is like what what does a methodology of like of ethnography for me like embody? Like what is what does it like always bring with it, and what can I like adapt and modulate when I when I like do work in the present day, and I don't want to be um, you know problematic like like 19th century ethnographers were. So. So we did have a question in the chat yeah. about diffraction. Yeah. Uh, so um, let me pull. Me. Um, so Marie said, I would like to hear your thoughts on diffraction. Some authors that advocate for diffraction consider reflection and reflexivity as reductionist and caught up in sameness whereas diffraction is attuned to differences. Yeah. Um, what is your view and experience on using diffraction? Yeah. And that's such a great question, Marie. I personally have not um, meaningfully and intentionally engaged, engaged in diffraction in my work because I tend to do um, more insider type of, of research or I, for me, um, we were just talking about methodologies. I tend to use a lot of inductive um, constructionist, particularly constructivist grounded theory um, methods. And for me, I'm always like looking at the links between me and my participants. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's such a great question. I, and Alex and Steven, if you guys have other comments, um, I didn't. I hadn't really known what in, what diffraction was until we wrote this paper, um, yeah. and we were recommended to to look at it. So, um, so yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I do I think wasn't, it's a very meaningful practice. I wasn't particularly familiar um, before writing this paper. Um, the two things I'll say are like one at, in writing the paper, we like tried to note in say the literature review that like a lot of these words are kind of similar to each other and maybe the like parsing between positionality, reflexivity, bracketing and diffusion was like maybe for where the engineering ed community is like not not super um, critical because like just all of these things would be like, you know, helpful and more, you know, research is peopled, um, you know, like a step in that direction. Um, so like, um, like I would just say like, yes, diffraction seems like it's great, like a, a great way of thinking about this as well. Um, and, you know, I'm not not super familiar, but the, it seems positive. The other thing was um, in looking at them, I think there are like these different subtle connotations that come about uh, between the different methods. And I think they are worth paying attention to. Like um, Cassandra in um, Grounded Theory was more familiar with this tradition of bracketing um, and the more we looked at the language in bracketing, the more it looked like it had like a quasi, like it, the goal was to kind of like depersonalize, like, like we are like going to bracket away our, our positionality. We're going to bracket away our, like our, our individual personal, um, aspects and like, then look true to the like clear, true theory, um, inside it, which I'm not, I'm not going to say is like a, uh, like a completely bad approach it's 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 you know and if you're within that tradition then that's the the main tradition um that people are using but i think they do carry these like other like subtle connotations with what the like there's a, there's a value system but behind how you talk about these things and i do think there's a danger the the thing that positionality i think is bringing is thinking very clearly about some social identities i think there could be some other dangers you know, like I think some people therefore think it's like just listing out some social identities without any reflexivity. And I would say that that's not, that's not the characterization I'm trying to like advocate. I do realize how you could steer that way if you read some of the papers, you know, and skimmed them. <laughs> um, and I do think that like diffraction has some other additional nuances that I think are are important to, you know, keep in in the conversation as well. So I think like, I think on one level, they're all great, like, let's all keep them. And then in, in another, like, let's also, like, I, sh I hope to also learn more about all the nuances between them and learn more about um, diffraction. Because I do, I do agree that there is a chance of positionality being a, like, I mean, we saw it in the literature that it was in, in our own review that it, like, for some people, it could turn into kind of a laundry list navel gazing. Um, so like that, that's the thing we're not advocating for. And my guess is what we're doing is kind of like, 
a step towards diffraction. You know, if we if we really stopped and like you know looked looked at all of it, I would guess that it would resonate with diffraction. But you can let me know if I'm wrong about that. There was another question in the chat um, about- yeah, Mary, we, we can't hear you, sorry. I think Mary was trying to talk to us, but we oh. can't hear you. Yeah. You're unmuted, but there's no sound coming through. Sorry. Can write more chats. So I, I see Natalie's question about like where you draw the line between autoethnography, autoethnographic work and positionality. Um, I guess, yeah, it is kind of, I, I, I think I understand the point of the question uh, that there's kind of a, what do I call not the research? Like where, what do I call the background information about myself as a researcher? And what do I call within the research, like what 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 is the like data within the research? I think that's a good question. Um, I yeah, <laughs> those are these are some of these are really interesting, nuanced, and challenging questions. And in some ways, I think like in writing the paper, the positionality paper is kind of like just like a, a like first like launch, like like kind of like start the conversation for engineering it about positionality and like the. The like, what's the positionality guidance for doing autoethnography? I think like that's that's an interesting nuance. It's such a small portion of our community that it wasn't really on my mind on our mind when we were <laughs> writing. But yeah, I don't know, Alex or or Cass, if you have any other additional thoughts about drawing the line between like reflective methods and positionality. I think can can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I think it's it's still very much as even mentioned in the beginning phases and I know for us I mean we wrote this paper you know to to just put it out there see see how people respond to it and our, our response has been very overwhelmingly positive um, and I think at the phase that we're at now it's still very much up to the commute the research community right so um, it's still evolving we're still trying to figure this out. Um, and so a lot of times too, I've noticed um, between an author and a reviewer, um, at least in terms of the work that we've done with, with JEE, it's been kind of this collaborative process um, where there's a push, you know, there's a push and pull. We're still, we're still figuring it out. So I think I'm just excited to see how it continues to evolve over time. Um, I've grappled with that same question myself, um, you know, because you don't, I don't want to make my research all about me, right? So I want it to be about my participants and the story that I'm telling and, and how I'm contributing to, you know, the broader body of, of knowledge. And yeah, it's it's still evolving. Um, I, I just want to say that one thing to keep in mind, too, is that um positionalities change right like they're not static and so maybe the way that i thought when i barely started my phd program was very different from the approaches that i have taken now just based on experiences based on the research questions that i want to address the how i want to communicate how i want to represent myself and my uh, participants in my research, um, the methodological choices, right? Like something that I have done in my own research is shifting to something that involves a more social political um, analysis and conversations with my participants. I've shifted to uh, methods that are more aligned with who I identify myself as, right? Like with Borderlands Theory, Gloria Saldua, and uh, Chicano feminist uh, approaches. And so I think that that is also something to, to keep in mind. Positionalities are not always static, right? They change over time. Um, I think that there's, here's where it, 
the 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 question about the diffraction or the reflexivity come into into play as well, right? Um, because um, I know that as researchers we want to be as objective as possible, <laughs> and in an effort to do so, uh, I think that sometimes what we end up doing is we try to detach ourselves too much from the work from the work that we're doing or the impact that we might be having on the research that, that we're doing. I think that that is also one of the reasons why we included here the researcher as an as an instrument um, in the in the in the the, the impact of the positionality. Um, and, and as uh, Cass said, you know, these are things that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's a right or wrong answer. Um, but I think that engaging in the most authentic way that you can, <laughs> it's always a good way to, to do it. Alex, when you were talking, it made me think of this too. Um, another thing that we're, you know, we have this concept of objective, right? And so depending kind of on what, um, what your worldview is, you know, what your ontology, ontological and epistemological beliefs are, I mean, I, I would say, and I ask my students this a lot, what, what do you mean when you say objective? You know, what, what are the standards that you're using? And so as Alex mentioned, you know, he uses these different types of methodologies that come from his cultural background and, and, um, and all of these more, yeah, socio-political uh, um, and anthropological fields. And I think for us, writing this is really kind of pushing back against these just very um, white, you know, colonizing type approaches that we've in the past taken for granted as being objective. And so starting to challenge that and shine a light on it um, and, and get people to question it, you know, and not necessarily say we need to construct everything, you know, back down to ground zero. You know, I tell my students gravity is gravity and everyone's going to agree with you that gravity exists and that it's a thing. Um, and, and so we have these different areas of understanding, um, but, to, but to particularly when we're doing educa engineering education research, and this is really where um, bringing that people aspect into it, what are we considering to be objective? How are we determining it? How are we measuring it? Even instrument development, if, if you're doing it, if you're working on an instrument or using a scale, you know, how was that scale created? How was that instrument created? What are the biases there? I was just, I can just say a couple of responses out loud. Uh, I was just typing them up. Um, but yeah, I like asking about whether we've had um, pushback from the community. Um, I, yes, yes, we've experienced pushback like over the years. This specific paper has been pretty well received, although like it it was well supported in the review process and the um like by by JEE. Um but over the years, certainly like part of the motivation to clarify this argument about why positionality was important is that people inside engineering ed, outside engineering ed were vague variously telling us the kind of like not to write in these ways, like not not to write not that this was pers very personal oversharing and not to say so. And I, just from my own experience, I like, I in the paper, I, I note that like, you know, around the like topic of communication, like, I think that if I don't talk about um, social identities that I like, if I'm writing about equity topics in particular, I think I come across, I think people can Google my name, look at my face and decide that I'm probably a white man and then assume that I am approaching all topics, uh, like kind of from the positionality of like, um, a white man, which I am, I, I, they, they have correctly deduced that. Although these days there's also the weird confusion that now I work at a, HS, a Hispanic serving institution and I have heard a couple of people just assume that I work there and my last name is strange and they just assume I work there because I'm uh, Latinx and I am not. So like that would be another another just thing I would love to like be clear on <laughs> so, so that like, people are not, are not misunderstanding my work. 
But in addition, the, um, there was a, some specific early pieces where I was trying to write about uh, gender and sexual orientation and uh, like made some, made some critical comments around gender and uh, sexual orientation and um, in, a, in a paper. And then in order to be better understood by, the, um, by some of the participants, I ha had to come out as gay um, like just to, it just made it a lot clearer to them wh who I was. I was, it was me making comments about a women in engineering group. And so I, I was kind of seen as a complete outsider to the group, um, in making these comments. And then I, by clarifying positionality, it was clear that I was like a partial insider to some of my comments, comments about sexual orientation, gender. Like I, I had a specific relationship to why I was making the comments, but I am still an outsider. I'm acknowledging I'm still an outsider to the women in engineering group. Uh, in general, and it was very helpful to the participants. And then there was some other uh, specific mentor who told me that this was completely inappropriate oversharing. And like, I would like, this was, I, I should never have written these words. And I was kind of, like, accused me of being strong armed into saying these things like, you know, like for some agenda or something. And I like, so it, I shared these, Cassandra and I were friends uh, through this like period and we kind of held on to those experiences. And and the writing of the personality pa paper this, the seed of the idea for it was really like to make the argument for that type of, I, I genuinely believed out of those experiences that it was 100% better to be brave enough to contextualize the work, like to not just depersonalize and let everybody guess. <laughs> I 100% knew that in those situations, it was better, but it was about like coming up with the right resources and, and like explanations to help other people understand that. So, and then assembling the right team to uh, help make that clear. So um, yeah, there's been, there's definitely been pushback. Um, and yeah, part of the like, kind of like calling for culture change around it, I think is like, is like by, by asking, by making the strong argument for it, like asking other people to, pre like, as much as they feel comfortable, present positionality statements, understand them when they're reviewers, uh, like, you know, suggest them when it could help, uh, you know, something be better uh, contextualized, better understood. In my view, I think it's still sort of up to interpretation and nobody should be oversharing what they, what they don't want, you know, shared in public. But in my view, like there is, because research is a very peopled, Thing. There just is a positive direction to move to be more clear about with each other about the people that we are like in in doing our work. I just think I think to, in my view it's it's a hundred percent a helpful direction. Uh, how we all each work it out is uh, is still you know open to our own choices. Do you mind if I just come in and ask a quick follow up to what you just yeah. said? Um, so then, to what degree do you think it's the place of a reviewer to make a comment on what's someone said in their positionality statement. And I guess I know it's maybe a bit out of scope now, but yeah. I guess by like, I think you are to some degree making yourself a bit vulnerable. And yeah. sometimes you might say something that other people find problematic. And I guess then like, there's a question about to what degree people should comment on that or how, how they go about doing it. Maybe I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um. <laughs> The thing, yes, I think it is making yourself vulnerable and it's still a part of the paper. So I, I, I myself as a reviewer have, have made comments about someone's positionality. Like, okay, there seem to be four long paragraphs and I like, I don't get anything, you know, like the, if they're very, to me, they come across very navel gazing, then I'm, I'm just letting you know, as a reviewer it seems to be taking up a lot of space and it has done very little for me. I hope that that doesn't come across very you know, you know, critical, uh, but it's just, so I think, I think it's kind of fair game. My other like flip side, you know, of that is like, I think we, I think I notice a lot of people making a lot of assumptions about authors, whether or not there's a positionality statement in like, like those example sentences I was giving. So to me, writing positionality statement, it is kind of fair game to like, let's all talk about it. Let's talk about if this was effective. Like, you know, it could get more vulnerable, but on the plus side, it's like a chance to own your story, like a chance to like, you know, clarify your position and message and, and identity and not be in some other space of like the reviewers aren't going to say what assumptions they made about you. You're not going to say what some, you know, what, what hidden things people should assume about you. Everybody's going to be, you know, skirting around their, like, like the, the actual people involved in this. I think, I think it's just a chance to be a bit clearer. Um, but yeah, I mean, like that's that's also my own, like just like little little window into this from my own experience. The the um, you know, like I, I think there probably are some some trickier 
you know, situations. Um, I know that Matilda, one of our co-authors shares in the paper about like writing, this was ultimately her deciding about the importance of writing positionality statements. But in the meantime, she had written kind of like a paper about mental health um, challenges as a person from kind of like a like had 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 suffering with an insider to the community positionality, but hadn't completely clarified that and had used some language that was meant to be provocative, you know, crazy and like uh, like had had been had been writing a paper in that way and then got into like a very heated like you know you're using pejorative language like about the the reviewer was part of the community they were they were offended. You know, I think I think it got very tense, but ultimately, I think her, although it was scary for her to, you know, identify in the paper, I think ultimately that's what she decided was like it's better, it's better to be clear rather than like kind of vague and, yeah, while you're being productive. So. I'll make I'm gonna make one quick comment and then I have to go teach. <laughs> so yeah. um, I will. Say, that's a great question, Natalie. One thing I do is I um I I. Since people are more used to writing it about methods, some of the things I do is I'll ask questions to get them thinking about that more and how they're linked to the methods. And it seems like once I do that, it kind of opens up the can a little bit and then they seem to, to provide a little more there. So, but thank you all so much. It was so great to see all of you. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming. I'm gonna sign off and, and go teach. Um. The other comment I want to make uh, about like, can we require positionality statements? Um, you know, if it's if it's private, I saw I saw in um, a, a chat comment um, by Jante. Uh, I just wanted to mention like, you know, for sure. I think one of the main messages is like, I don't think an editor can demand any particular disclosure of anyone's identities. Like, even if it would help the paper be, you know. So ultimately, these are like sort of suggestions, like you know, kind of call, like suggestions to the community. But um, I would hope that reviewers, like the editors and reviewers, don't come down on the side of like, like this is the one. If you don't tell us these things about yourself, you can't write this type of paper. Um, I, on the other hand, I think like. And and some some aspects of positionality are certainly private. I as a as a uh, I, I think a lot of the people who get most sensitive to positionality come from more dominant groups, and their experiences of like maybe being in that dominant group is not particularly private information. Um, that they it's not that being a man or a white man is the sensitive thing that you don't want to tell people. Uh, it's that it's that it feels difficult like from a like it, it, I think it can feel like a uh a way in our culture I think it can feel like you're discounting your own perspective but I would say that as a as a white man I would say that it does not have to be discounting of your own perspective I think it can be very clarifying and like contextualizing and help the work be better understood too like let's just let's just name the fact that I am these identities and then like let's talk about what those mean to me on the other hand yeah there are definitely some I, I won't even say that it's category by category because there's definitely some aspects of people's race and gender that could be very still very private and they don't want to like completely unload in in a full paper in print one of the weird things about writing things down in print is they like stand searchable on the internet for forevermore you know so <laughs> even even writing this paper I was like what if any of these identities change in five years uh, and yeah mm -hmm. I think somewhere Alex saying like positionality does change I think like you just you just write it in the moment when it write the thing that makes the most sense to like tell people at the time of your writing and then if it changes you know it changes um but yeah I would say that like the other more private details um I I would still think that like you know I'm like from queer, gay, LGBTQ community, I would say that like within our community and in a disability rights community that I am not a member of, I would say that there's a lot of discussion about how we've got to, you know, the whole coming out movement. There's a lot of discussion about like, like we should, it's scary and could make us vulnerable, but like the more we talk about it, the more we like don't have to presume that all engineering ed authors are straight people or um, able-bodied people, because that is not actually true. And it's not a helpful, it's not helping the community better understand the work to have that be our like oh I'm just assuming you're a straight white man because you're writing in JEE -E or um, EJEE -E. mm. that's that's just that's my default assumption but like more clarifying more more clarifying of who we all are I think like helps us better understand um, our, each other and each other's work um, so yeah like the 
any, I think any particularly sensitive identities should not be um, shared, but I would nudge anybody who, <laughs> any identities that are not actually, like uh, a lot of people, I think, you know, we we can tell each other our pronouns like pretty quickly in the beginning of meetings a lot of times. And that is helpful, you know, to, to know instead of guessing like based on, you know, people's names or, or you know, whatever. So that's my messy, not, not really clear answer. But. Thank you so much. I think I'm conscious about time. I think I would stay here for a few more minutes, oh, yeah. but yeah, we're almost almost over. Yeah. Um, any burning questions, any burning remarks? So I'll just make one more comment about the an anonymous review piece. I, as an yeah. editor, um, when I when I have nudged people in suggested positionality, I always include that you can redact as much of this as you'd like. Um, you know, like it would even be, even if it starts to read impossible, like blank is a blank, 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 and blank. And for that reason, blank, 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 blank. It's still indicating that you are going to give that information. Um, you know, like I, I would definitely, if I was trying to preserve anonymous review, I would definitely not reveal something. You know, if I if I told you, I was a gay white researcher focused on equity in the southeastern United States at a large public HSI. It wouldn't take you very long to Google and like figure out exactly who I was. So I would probably reduce some of that disclosure and not I would not put that all in the in the um you know in the anonymous review because it's it would just defeat the purpose. But I think I think redacting or or even coordinating with an editor, like, you know, I want to add a positionality statement entirely, but I want to do that like post review. I think those are I think those are all like fine options just to just um I've also seen people reviewers adding positionality comments. Um and I also think that that shouldn't be required, but that that is another option we have to help pe us understand where reviewer comments and critiques are coming from. Um, sure, we can make the slides available. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen, Alex, and Cass is gone, but yeah. it was great to have you three here today. Uh, I think we've learned so much and the discussion was amazing. I think we could go on and on. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you for your time once again and uh, all the best for everyone. Thank you.